ladies and gentlemen, independent Americans around the country and around the world. Spring is here. The vaccine is coming. Trump is gone. Things are looking up. And Wes Moore is returning to the program. I am very happy to bring back a returning champion, one of our original champions from one of the first 10 episodes, the great and powerful Wes Moore returns. Hey, it's great to be with you, brother. And I am so proud of you. I'm proud of everything you're building. And you're right, it was crazy. I woke up this morning and I swear, I think it was the first morning that I woke up for a, for a run and the sun was already starting to come up. And now it's at six o'clock tomorrow. I was like, oh my gosh, Good. like these are really, Things are different. It's happening. It's ha We had our mutual friend Darren Walker on a couple weeks ago, and he said, "Hope is is the oxygen of democracy," yes. and that hope is flowing and pumping. And I want to share it and spread it. And you you're like a walking uh, super spreader of hope, and you have been your whole life and career. And that's why I'm so excited to have you back on right now. Um, see, I got dressed up for you. For folks watching on video, I actually wore a jacket for like maybe the first time in a year. And you got like, it look, you got a t-shirt on, man. It looks like a very nice t-shirt. It it's good. not a $20 t-shirt, but that was, you have a, you have a t-shirt on. I do. But you know what though? Actually, this is dressing up and I'll yeah? explain. Okay. Um, and actually you talk about hope. This is, this, this, this shirt epitomizes hope for me. So this shirt is actually part of the, uh, the, the Under Armour Devin Allen collection. For those who don't know, Devin Allen is a an, an activist, a photographer. He's a, he's a you know an African American photographer who now has two covers on Time Magazine. Um, one was during uh, you know both were was during times of protest, but the first one was actually this really iconic shot of 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 a person running with this whole phalanx of, of police officers you know behind him. When I know the shot, the, yeah. The rising in Baltimore, classic classic shot. Um, and the thing I love about this is that the that he's just a kid from baltimore who is i think devin probably now is 30 years old uh but he's become this world-renowned photographer from baltimore and now he has an entire he's got a shoe line with under armor he's got an entire clothing collection and the beautiful thing about that for me is you know usually that thing is reserved for you know the basketball star or the football star an activist got his own line a photographer got his own line. And there's just something so beautiful about it. So every time when people say, all right, you have to dress up, for me, that means put on the Devin Allen collection. So that's what I'm, that's what I'm repping today. Well, thank you for getting dressed up. It, it looks very nice. It also yeah. is like, you know, that is a very nice shirt. Uh, the Rock has a line at Under Armour now, right? Like that's one of your many involvements. Uh, a lot to get into. Uh, the last time you joined us was June 2019. We had just kicked off the show. It was Father's Day. We were in New York together at the Classic Car Club. You were, uh, you know, a couple years into Robin Hood. You were going back and forth between Baltimore and New York. A lot of Baltimore things we, we dug into. And there's a lot of Baltimore things I'd love to dig into now. But it's a year after the pandemic. You have been one of the helpers. You're on the front lines every day, making this country better, adding light to the heat. Um, tell folks, please, Wes, where are you? And how are you? And how are the people around you one year into this pandemic? So I'm, uh, I'm, I'm here in Baltimore uh, and where we've been. We actually just passed the, the, uh, the, the year commemoration for, for closing our offices. We closed our offices on May 2nd last year. Um, so we closed pretty early. And, and we started noticing pretty early how damaging this was going to be. We had a couple of members of our team get sick, um, you know, pretty early. And, uh, and we started just seeing, because especially because New York really was the epicenter of all this, that, uh, and I remember, I remember calling up Dawn, my wife, who adores you, Paul, and was just like, you know, I'm going to have to close the office. And, and I said, I think I'm going to close the office for like three months. And I said it to her like that was a long period of time. I was like, three months. God, that's so crazy. And she was like, I think it's going to be longer than that. And we now just passed a year and our offices are still closed. Mm. And, you know, I, I, it's, it's hard to even, it's hard to even quantify how damaging this year has been for our communities. Um, and I say that because not that it is, not that it's difficult. I mean, like we have watched, we watched 11 years of job growth go away in 11 weeks, right? We watched the, the, the shuttering of industries especially when you're talking about like the hospitality industry 
hotels and restaurants, which were actually the industries that were doing the, the, the that were employing the population that we serve more than any other employment sector, right? You know, those who are low wage workers, people who are undocumented, uh, you know, people of color, et cetera, right? Um, so you saw how the quantifiable impacts of this hit really hard and show themselves in a variety of different ways. But it's also really difficult for me not to separate just how personally damaging this has been to watch friends, mm. watch our partners in the work, mm. watch the mental health challenges, watch how difficult it's been to have kids who are now in school. But like, for example, in Baltimore City, 61% of high school freshmen right now are chronically absent. Mm. Literally, we don't know where they are. 61% of Baltimore City high school freshmen are missing more than 30% of the school year. So, so, so while the, while the data is, 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 is incredibly troubling about how difficult this year has been, it's, it's just, it's the personal stories that for all of us that we know too well, um, that have just made this year, uh, a really, really hard and complicated one. I'm so glad you, you are, um, framing it that way because I think it's very important, especially for leaders like us that are in the public sphere to be honest about how hard it's been and to be honest about how damaging it's been, recognizing that me, you, we've been lucky comparatively. But I got this feeling right now where everybody thinks the end of the war is coming, right? And maybe the war, maybe there'll be a formal ceasefire and we'll declare an end to the pandemic. And then there'll be these like little flare ups. It might be a variant. It might be an insurgency, right? If we use this war context. Mm -hmm. But people who've been to war know that the war doesn't end when the fighting stops. That's right. And then we're going to get into the trauma and the loss and the pain and the long tail of everything from mental health, you know, to financial ruin and recognizing that not everybody experienced this war differently. Some people got out. Some people had to stay deep in, in the crosshairs. So you're you're shaping all of that through your example and through your work. Um, you're also, you know, more and more a thought leader, you know, you're interpreting everything going on in the world, you're keeping yourself uh, sane, you got a beautiful family, I look to you as a mentor, uh, for as a father, you've taught me a lot, and Don's taught me a lot about parenting. Um, but I don't ask, I'm not going to ask you the drinking question anymore. But I am going to ask you some, some, some recent news questions. Uh, there is a lot of good stuff happening, including coming to America Two happened. I don't know if I've been more excited about a movie in maybe in five years, then like maybe longer than, than coming to America too, right? Like I accidentally played it for my son once and my wife was like, do you realize what you just played for our five-year-old? But uh, did you see it? Uh, Wes Moore, what did you think of coming to America too? I did see it. We actually watched it as a family and I thought it was fantastic. And I know all these, I know there's people out there who throw shade on, oh, wasn't as good as the original, wasn't good as the original. First of all, saying it wasn't good, as good as the original is kind of like saying, you know, oh, it wasn't good as perfection. The original was perfection, I get it. But the second one was really good. I mean, like Eddie Murphy came with it. I thought the fact that he brought in all the characters in the cast from the last time was fantastic. I thought that that Wesley Snipes was freaking hilarious and was a great addition. And I and I have to tell you, I love the fact that I could actually watch it. You know, our our daughter's now nine, our son is now seven, and maybe there might be a couple few parts, but I love the part, the love the fact that we could watch it as a family and really enjoy it and 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 just laugh at all these you know at all these same parts. So I thought it was great, man, and and well worth the wait. He did a great job with it. I'm a hundred percent with you. It's great. I ended it and I looked at Lauren and said, that was great. Yeah. That was just great, right? And they they even cleaned some things up. Like, you know, the bath scene is a little bit cleaned up, right? Like they they, they knew they were going to have a bigger audience on this one. But, you know, the all the cameos are amazing. Right. Like when En Vogue comes out, right? And Dikembe Mutombo with the no, and no, no. Chocolate. Like <laughs> sexual chocolate came back. All of them, right? And the music, the John Legend <laughs> song at the end, like, uh, yeah. they just, like, you know, it was so cool because they had so much time and it was such an iconic and important groundbreaking film, right? Like, I don't, w w was Louis Anderson like the only white guy in the first one? One of the only white guys in the first one? They bring him back. But it, now it has so much more um, gravity, I think, right? 
and and the time it's coming into you know everything is changing so fast and in many i don't want to dismiss it as just entertainment like that was an important important cultural touch point um and it was just really fun right like and, and you know, and and there there were some really, and I don't want to ruin it for people who have who have not seen it yet. I yeah. really urge you to go see it. Um, but even when you think about the themes that they were drawing around it, and the things that were in some cases subtle, and in some cases not so subtle, about how we think about power in our society, who has power and who doesn't, and how we think about transfers of power and what it means to make our society better, oftentimes means looking in different places for people who should assume that mm -hmm. power. So again, I'm not trying to ruin it no. for people who haven't seen it, but um, but you'll, you'll see what I mean when you see the movie. But I thought he did a beautiful job of, of kind of like sticking the landing when it comes to actually forcing our society to ask questions about power and autonomy and authority. It was, it was really well done. I mean, gender equality, race, exactly. you know, socioeconomic status, international relations, exactly. combat, like all of it is packed into coming to America in a really artful and I think important way. And it's happening in a context where, you know, Black Panther was was so game changing, right? Like the idea that when, when I was in, my son's in kindergarten, you know, writers in kindergarten, like the idea that white kids want to be Black Panther. Yes. Right. Like there was no, you know, were there any black superheroes that we could be when we were kids that we knew? I mean, not that you could really think of unless you were like a really big Marvel geek. Right. But now kids are fighting over who's going to be Black Panther. Right. And the the, the impact of that is so tremendous. Um, mm -hmm. And I thought about the, how the women of, of, of the family are empowered. Right. And they're these like kick ass karate masters. Right. Yeah. But so all of that is happening on another really uh, complicated, charged, global experience, which is the Meghan and Harry interview. You've been a leader on race. And part of me was like, you know what? I'm not going to watch this. I'm going to watch The Expanse again, by the way, which has a Baltimore connection. If you're not into The Expanse, you will find out. There is a Baltimore connection. They go deep into Baltimore in season five, 200 years into the future. So if you haven't seen that, oh, wow. oh, oh yes. Oh yes, Wes. I'm glad I gave you that one. Expanse fans know what I'm, what I'm talking about. But- I watched The Expanse and I was like, you know what? I have to watch this because it seems to be really unleashing and un unpacking a conversation around race in America and in the world. So, you know, I don't know if you've met Prince Harry. He's he's done a lot of work in the U.S. in philanthropy and especially in the veterans community. A lot of folks don't realize he's a tested combat vet. Um, but what, what are your takeaways? You're a thought leader in America, especially on issues of race and class and all the other stuff that's impacted there. What are your takeaways from that interview? You know, I, um, well, you know, for, I, I have had a chance to meet, uh, to meet Prince Harry and then, uh, uh, and, you know, and the first of all, I, I thought that, you know, Oprah just did an absolutely magnificent job with that interview as she always does. Um, because, you know, she just has, she has a, a remarkable ability just to pull truth out in a way that is just, uh, so, so digestible to everybody. Mm. But I thought the interview was really, um, was really powerful, not just because of the, 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 bombshell revelations that everybody's talking about, but I, I thought that it was what was behind those revelations that were really hard hitting and lasting. And, and frankly, I think there is this idea of a racial tension that had to be understood and not even just within, you know, Buckingham Palace or within the royal family, right? It is this idea of a tension that seeps and sits within our society at, at large that we still haven't fully wrestled with. And, you know, and, and, and I was thinking about it, Paul, where, uh, you know, about four months ago, there was a new, uh, there was a, you know, a, Johns Hopkins actually did a, did, a, did, a, did a research within its own university history. And there was always this lasting uh, understanding that Johns Hopkins, the founder of Johns Hopkins, uh, who the university is named after, um, was this great abolitionist, right? That was the narrative that we all got about Johns Hopkins, who he was, what he contributed. And John, you were a student there, you played I football do. there, you're on the board there, you That's grew right. up nearby, right? You, you, your, right. your story of Hopkins is, is legendary now. You're it one is. of the, their most, the most celebrated yeah. graduates. That's right. And, and legendary and complicated when right. it comes to its relationship with the history of, with Baltimore City. But we always had this as an understanding that this was this history. And, and a few months ago, after Hopkins did its own research, it realized that that story that they were telling about Johns Hopkins was not complete. 
and that Johns Hopkins was actually a slave owner as well. And what was fascinating was it really, it, it forced me to actually take a moment and think to myself, all right, I, whether it was the school I attended as my undergraduate institution, Johns Hopkins, whether it was the military bases that I was trained at, places like Fort Manning and Fort Bragg. I mean, Fort Bragg is, is named after Braxton Bragg, I mean, a Confederate general, and not a very good general at that, mm. right? <laughs> a traitor, a loser, but we're named Fort Bragg after him. Um, I went to Oxford University on a Rhodes Scholarship named after Cecil Rhodes, who was one of the most virulent racists. Uh, and, you know, literally where, you know, in, in this quest and to the point that he became the wealthiest man in the world at the time, um, you know, was doing it knowing that there were just thousands of bodies, black bodies that were lost uh, in the quest for, in the, in the, in the search in these, in these diamond mines. And I thought to myself, well, I was like, well, every single place that helped to train me were either founded or named after people who despised me. And that, the reality of that tension, the reality of, 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 of someone being asked about what it means that asking a question about how their child will look, will be interpreted, how that will be interpreted, how that will have ramifications and implications on things. There is a, there's a larger and a deeper tension that I think that interview highlighted that we as a large society have got to have the maturity and the courage to wrestle with. Understanding that our history does matter and, 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 and an examination of that history, an examination of how we got here, an examination of why those things still exist, about why in 2020, or 2019, those conversations were being had with Prince Harry about you know, what his child would look like. In, in, in Buckingham Palace, we have to be able to delve into that, not just because, not to play, you know, uh, you know, I told you so, or gotcha, or anything along those lines. But if we are planning on moving forward as a collective society, if we're planning on doing this in a way that is honoring of all of our humanity, then we can't be afraid of the hard. We can't be afraid of the suck. We can't be afraid of the complicated. And that's one of the things I really liked about that, that, that interview was once again, it gave our world a chance to have a conversation with the complicated. And instead of shying away and turning our eyes away, knowing that if we can do this, that we will be better because of it. Mm. Mm. And it's, you know, it, it takes leadership to blow things up that need blowing up. Right. And, and, you know, I can't imagine how many conversations you've been in places like Oxford or Hopkins, but now we've got, you know, Harry and Megan that are blowing up what in many, you know, people forget from afar was, it was at times a very oppressive racist regime. Right. I mean, and, and, you know, it's not, it's not just black people. I mean, the, the Irish aren't crazy about the monarchy either. Right. I mean, there's plenty of elements of this, um, that, that are really important to unpack, but a lot of systems are being blown up right now. And a lot of resets are happening. And as we have this conversation this week, the house and Senate will pass Biden's so far signature piece of legislation, the coronavirus, uh, you know, uh, emergency supplemental, um, that is, you know, one of the biggest bills, if not the biggest bill in, in, in recent American history. Uh, there's a really important point of this that you've been advocating very strongly on that I think is underreported which is uh, the, the child tax credit, right? Um, can you explain to folks who maybe don't appreciate this, what is the tax credit, the child tax credit, and why is it so important for everything? Not just for poor kids, not just for poor people, not just for kids. Why is this such a, a important inflection point for everything? I'd say, and, and for, for, for those who are just listening, um, I'd say I'm smiling from ear to ear. Uh, as you asked this question, Paul, I mean, we have been pushing for a long time on this adjustment to the child tax credit. And the fact that this is now getting ready to go and become law. If you, if you would have said to me a year and a half ago or two years ago saying, you know, we can make adjustments on the child tax credit, and I'll, I'll explain in a second what exactly that means. 
I, I would have said, listen, in, in my in my greatest hopes, it's a long shot. Right. What the child tax credit is, the child tax credit is essentially it's a it's a it's a tax credit that goes to any parent within our society. And it's it was intended to be a poverty fighting tax credit, right? Something for families so that they can have a little bit of extra money if they have children and to be able for them to use it for, you know, use it for whatever it is they choose to use for, for tutoring for their kids, for to take their kids out for pizza or maybe a movie, for, for, for maybe to taking them to, uh, you know, giving them, uh, you know, uh, coaching lessons or whatever it is, but it's just a little bit of extra money. Just or, to- or diapers or daycare or food. Right. Anything. Right. But just taking a little bit of extra pressure, particularly off of those who are living in in poverty and those who are in really complicated circumstances. And when we say people living in poverty, oftentimes we have to be clear that 24 percent of people who lost their jobs due to COVID-19 were people who were living in poverty before COVID-19, i.e. the working poor. Right. People who were working jobs and in some cases multiple jobs and still living below the poverty line. Right. So we created this child tax credit as a way of being able to provide a little bit of breathing room to families who are some of the most under-resourced families in our country. But it had flaws. One of the big flaws that it had was that you there was an earning that a person had to have in order for them to qualify for the child tax credit. So, for example, anywhere between 24 and 27 million children, children every single year did not qualify for the child tax credit because their family was too deep in poverty. And that goes back to what we're saying too, when you're talking about the people who are oftentimes the working poor, you know, the ones who are changing bed sheets and serving coffee, picking up trash, right? People who we see and interact with every single day and we have no idea of the type of pressure that they are facing every day to support their families. And so what the adjustment to the child tax credit does, what this bill does is essentially makes that the child tax credit fully refundable. So it does it, so we've eliminated the idea of an earning. And what we're then pushing for is now to make it permanent. What that is going to do is this for those 24 to 27 million children, you now qualify. In the stroke of a pen poll, we are going to cut child poverty by half. Yep. In the stroke of a pen. So for you, if, if you have a child under the age of six, you now have a thirty six hundred dollar child tax credit every single year that gets paid monthly, but every single year you get a thirty six hundred dollar tax credit. If your child is is over the age of six, that is a, is a, is a three thousand dollar credit. But that is money for you to be able to support your child and support your family in ways that you know that your family and your child needs in that moment. And so this is the this is the most powerful and expansive, not just poverty fighting mechanism that we have passed now in, in, in four decades, but it's the most brilliant and the most innovative and the most assertive way of policy that we have ever put in place that is actually fundamentally supporting our children. And I think about it in context for, you know, even our work in Robin. You know, I run one of the largest poverty fighting organizations in this country. And for when you look at over the past 32 years of Robin Hood's existence, that we have allocated north of $3 billion into the poverty fight. What this bill will do, what this adjustment to the child tax credit will do is it will take 32 years of what we have put into the poverty fight all combined, and that will be eclipsed in the stroke of a pen. Mm. That's how important this bill how much, is. How much, Wes, do you know, how much is it? If you had to total it all together, it's gotta be, you know, it's tens of billions, I don't know, hundreds of billions, right? And so I think you and I have talked over the years and worked together on issues and under uh, underscored the importance of advocacy. Because all the hedge fund guys in New York can fund all the soup kitchens in the world. But if you don't change policy, you're not moving the needle, right? Sure. We did this together with the GI Bill and with other, right? You know, government has a scale that is that is unprecedented, right? And so now, you know, this massive uh, in- inflection point that'll probably change poverty more than since Johnson was president, right? Um, half the kids will, will hopefully be out of poverty. And it's coming at a crisis time, right? May, you know, crisis presents opportunity. And maybe that presents an opportunity for people to come together on this and get it through. I was listening to Charlie Kirk, the right wing talk show host, and he was supporting this because he said, you know what, it's going to support families and I want people to have more kids and we have a, you know, a, a population growth problem. So even conservatives 
are, are supporting this and it's going to happen, right? And it's going to provide reinforcements down to the community. And I think it's coming at a critical time because you and I are also on the front lines of many of the issues that are the longer tails of the pandemic to include mental health, right? You have been out in front. I have been out in front. We've talked about our service and the organizations we work with, but we're starting to see the lights blink. I mean, they're long since blinking, right? But, um, you know, COVID, the economy, the stress, the isolation, the mental health toll is tremendous. And you and I continue to lose friends very close to us. And, and I appreciate you joining me now because I know you're going through a hard time. You just lost someone close to you. Can you talk about what you see coming, what you think people need to know, and as much as you're comfortable sharing about, you know, what's been going on? Yeah. Yeah. Um... Uh, and, and first, I, I got to tell you, Paul, I mean, you have you have led on this issue, not, not just for as long as I've known you, which is, you know, 15, 20 years, but even before that, uh, you have been you have been pushing on the importance of policy and advocacy You've been pushing on the importance of understanding mental health, because, you know, you uh, like so many of us, you know, we continue to see these daily reminders of, of, of that just because a person says they're okay does not mean they're okay. And, uh, and just recently uh, we lost um, uh, another, another brother of ours, uh, a veteran, uh, First Sergeant Boyd McDaniels. Um, and you know, the, 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 challenges that, um, the challenges that families are facing, and I remember I was speaking to his, his, his brother who was a dear friend when I first heard the news and, uh, and I was dreading the reasons why and um and he just sent me a note back and he just sent me a text back and just said uh and it just simply said you know mental health is real mm. and i know exactly what i know exactly what he was talking about i know exactly what happened mm. um we have got to we cannot overstate the psychological the mental health damage that not just that this period has caused but it's that this period has compounded. Mm. It's that we've had these challenges and these issues for a very, very, very long period of time. Um, we, we, we know it, we see it. And then when we add on this additional stress, the additional burden of the, of, of employment instability, of wage instability, of families going through other additional traumas of not being able to get together as friends and family and just a hug, Mm -hmm. Oh, I haven't, you know, my, my mom and my grandmother, you know, they live, they're here in Maryland. They live 20 minutes away from me. Um, I haven't given them a legit hug in a year. We cannot underestimate the type of damage this is doing. And to your point, how long this tale is. Now, I think what also does become really important in all of this is it is both about are we making sure that we're checking up on people. It is about how we're making sure that we're, you know, making sure folks are okay. Or are, are we making sure that we're being extra diligent about connecting? But it is also about how are we going to make sure that our policies match the problems? Mm. How are we making sure that the funding that is needed to be able to do everything from mental health screening to mental health supports actually match the enormity and the scope of the challenge? Yeah. That we're now facing yeah. and this really becomes our larger societal our larger societal test is where we can talk about the basics of infrastructure and all these other elements but the mental health damage that we continue to see and and i'm so tired of getting phone calls and text messages from friends yep. i'm so tired of it yep but it means we're gonna have to be incredibly diligent and stubborn about actually getting at both root causes and the actual hurt of now, because there is a hurt of now that is taking place within our communities. Thank you for sharing that, especially, you know, sharing the, the story of First Sergeant Daniels. Um, you know, you and I are in this world where, you know, we're constantly emailing and texting and it's like every day, we got another one, we got another one, we got another one. It's like the hashtag, you know, our friends are dying and they're dying all around us, have been 17 veterans a day, the estimates are it's many other people, you know, the policy idea that I hope starts to take hold is I feel like this last Biden bill, this new Biden bill is, is the bill we need to end the war. Right. And it reminds me of like the last war supplemental in the Middle East. 
Mm. And they forgot to fund the VA afterward. Right. So what we're going to need, in my view, is a massive policy push. that's going to look like a reconstruction bill. Right. That deals with the mental health toll, as an example. Right. Maybe just the mental health toll, but recognizing our people are wounded after combat. Our people are hurting. It doesn't go away because we open all the restaurants in the schools and that damage is forever. And we're going to need to invest in that, maybe even at a higher level than we did in this bill. So I'm good. I'm throwing that idea out in the universe. I know you'll support it. Um, we have. We have and, a short. And, and can I say one more thing too? Yeah. And be intentional about it. Right? Yeah. Yeah, yeah. And be, be intentional about the fact that, you know, let's not dance around the language. Right. Right. We right. are going to put X funding for mental health. Right. Right. Don't dance around this. Call yeah. it what it is. It's, 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 it's that or people die. That's it. Like, like you can't keep talking about, and, I, and I've been critical of, of, of all the VA secretaries. I think that Secretary McDonough has been doing some good things out of the gate. You know, I don't think he was the right choice, but I'm going to support him now. You know, his answer on suicide in his first press conference sounded like everybody else's answer. Like we are not pulling the, 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 the alarm like this is not all hands on deck. We are not recognizing how many people are dying. So I'm going to keep banging on that drum. I know you will as well. Related. And we don't have a lot of time left. Uh, um, related. Um, there are a lot of folks um, that are lost, uh, that are prone to extremism. You have been on the front lines of, of combating extremism, white nationalism, uh, institutionalized racism. Um, you and I, were, you connected me with, with the family of uh, Lieutenant Richard Collins, who was tragically murdered in 2017 um, in Maryland. Uh, that was, it was past a warning sign, right? Folks say, well, where were the warning signs? Did you not see that Lieutenant Collins was murdered on the streets and we talked about it and he couldn't be buried properly by his family. Now his murderer has been sentenced to prison, life in prison, not a hate crime, I believe, right? Um, but that was a warning. So let me ask you to unpack the all of it. You, you're gonna be on the front lines fighting this domestic threat, trying to get people not to convert to extremism. What, how do you wanna break down where we are right now in relation to that immediate national security, domestic, you know, ex existential threat? You know, and um, and 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 I'll 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 take a moment both to give you a shout out for your leadership and what happened with Lieutenant Collins. But I, I think I just want to give a context to 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 the to the audience about who this young man was. Um, he was a third generation soldier. Um, his grandfather was also in the army, and in fact, his grandfather, uh, after serving overseas, uh, was killed. By uh, by a white supremacist when he came home and was uh, when he, when he came home from deployment, his father then served in the military, uh, and his father, uh, who he and his and his wife Dawn have become you know have become close friends, was, uh, talked about his pride when when Richie said that he wanted to join the army and join RTC. He goes through RTC. He um you know for 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 those who in the service, there's a there's a there's almost like a day or two delay between when you get commissioned and when you actually graduate. Um, it's like, you know, kind of, it's a quirky thing that for all of us who've done it, we don't think about, but it matters in this case because he was commissioned later on that night. He went out to go celebrate with friends. He was a student at Louis State University, at HBCU in, in Maryland. Um, and he was at the University of Maryland College Park and someone came up to him and stabbed him in the chest and he died. And because he was commissioned, but wasn't yet, wasn't yet a graduate, because he didn't, you know, officially graduate from Bowie State because he had that, that distance, um, there were complications as to how exactly he would be recognized in the military, covering the funeral. Um, there were questions, even as this case went to trial, about, well, even though this person had a whole series and slew of uh, of things on on their website and uh, you know white supremacy writings and so on and so forth, but was this really a hate crime? Because you know you know what he said to Richie was step left, and Richie said I'm sorry. And then when he said I'm not stepping left, the guy told him, move to the left. And he said I'm moving left. He stabbed him in the chest. So there were actually there were now bills that have been passed, and uh, where even though he was not convicted of, of a hate crime, we now have bills that were that were passed, uh, you know, for example, called the Richard Collins Act, uh, which allows prosecutors to pursue hate crime charges for acts motivated in part by hate, right? 
this is, these are things, and one of the reasons that I'm so blessed by the Collins family is, this is a family who epitomizes this idea of turning pain into purpose, right? They have never stopped fighting to protect not just the legacy of Richie, but to protect the fact that this should never have to happen again to any family, like what happened to their son. And I think that, the, and I think one thing we're seeing right now is, you know, we are, are, are hitting this point in our, in our nation where there is so much distrust, frustration, hatred, history that is now turning into almost this very toxic cocktail uh, that is showing itself in really ugly ways like what we saw with Lieutenant Collins, like what we saw on January 6th. And I think this is actually an important moment for our nation to be able to take a real beat, to be able to take a pause and breathe, mm. and to really think about what kind of country are we trying to be? Are we trying to be a country where we will repeatedly be at each other's throats? Or are we going to be a country that is going to look at our, at our, at our, at our history and to be able to understand that understanding that process is important for us to be able to get to the process of healing. Understanding that, 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 that this nation's history has been uneven, that this nation's history has been violent, that this nation's history has been unequal. But we also understand this, that we have had this moral arc that Dr. King talked about, the moral arc of, uh, that bends towards justice, but at every single step, it bends towards justice, not because of inevitability. It bends towards justice because there are people who are pulling it that way. Mm. And that's the thing that we have to consistently focus on and think about how, how do we take that history? How do we take that, that uh, and take this moment to be able to build not just a new, but build something in many ways that's just completely reimagined. So thank you for sharing that, for leading on it. You know, huge, uh, Thanks and, and gratitude to the Collins family, to you, to Allison Jaslow, so many other people that pushed this forward, right? People came out in many ways, but the fight does not end. That, that, that arc is bent because of Richie Collins, because of the Collins family, because of leadership, because of you. Um, this is a moment for leadership. Uh, anyone who's listened to you has been inspired by you. I asked you and Willie Geist to run for anything, uh, you know, two years ago on this show. Okay. I hope that maybe Willie will run for mayor because that might be still open if Andrew Yang doesn't win. Uh, I think a lot of folks would like to see you run for governor of New York. There's a lot of controversy happening there around Governor Cuomo. Um, and you have publicly said you are exploring running for governor in Maryland. I have never seen a more universally positive, excited reaction from people than when you said you might run. Um, I know you, you, you heard that. Um, you know, people telling me, where can I sign up? How can I move to Maryland? Uh, you know, how far is Baltimore from where I live? People want you to run uh, and you're exploring it. Uh, you know, number one, do you want to make any news here today? Uh, and number two, um, this is independent Americans. Uh, are you at all considering running as an independent? Uh, so I am, uh, I, I'm, uh, I'm, uh, I'm a very, very proud Marylander, born down here, raised down here, uh, live down here now. Um, and, and I am seriously exploring, uh, looking at the, at, the, at the governor's race in Maryland. And, you know, and it's, and it's one of these things, Paul, where, you know, I, I think for all of us, we consistently pressure test ourselves of, of how we can best be of service in certain moments. Um, where where I, I think about so many of the issues that have been my life's issues, um, they're on the ballot. Every single one of the issues that we have been working on and fighting on, that many of we've been working on together, they are on the ballot. And so when I think about what is going to be the direction of my state, what is going to be the direction of the Democratic Party, what is going to be the direction of all of these elements uh, of how we think about this, and knowing that we actually can be bold and that's okay. That we can actually get some important work done and it's urgent that we actually try to get it done. And so uh, I, I really am very seriously, uh, you know, considering this. I'm very seriously exploring this and I'm very seriously, uh, you know, just pushing on this idea of asking myself, um, 
is, is, is this the way that I can best be useful and best be of service in this moment? Uh, and it's been, it's been a, it's been a powerful process. And particularly when I think about, you know, where, where we are as, a, as an organization with Robin, I'm so proud of what this organization has accomplished in, in you know, in, in my four and a half years here, the organization has never been in a stronger place. And I'm proud of that. I'm proud of the team that we built. I'm proud of what we got gotten done. Uh, and I really am just thinking through now. It's like, you know, so how, how do we think about the next battles that, uh, that I mean, that I want to take on? Well, we need selfless leaders leading those battles. And I think that your examination and consideration of this process is not just a test for you. It's a test for us. Like this is an example. I, I said, I think when I had you on the first time, uh, more in 24. Uh, so maybe it's going to be more in 22, but we need to encourage you to run. We need to create a space where you can run. We need, whether it's campaign finance reform or people from different parties coming together or volunteers willing to step up. You know, there, there is this wave of leaders like you and many people we know who haven't run over the last 10, 15 years, who we need to run, who we need to draft. And, you know, you're a guy, I don't care what party you run from, you're going to have my support and you're going to have people from a, from a lot of backgrounds supporting you. And I think those are the kind of transformative leaders we need. So um, I'm, this is my challenge to everyone is like, we need to get Wes Moore to continue to rise. You, you always sign your emails at Elevate and you're, you're, the, you're, you're such an inspiring leader because you pull people up with you, whether it's the folks at Robin Hood, your team, the Collins, you know, everyone, this is the kind of leader we need for this moment. Um, because shit's hard and it's going to be hard for a while. And we need leaders with courage and who can bring people together and who can bring in artists and Oprah and Under Armour and philanthropy and all this shit together. So, you know, I'm, I am always, you know, one of your biggest fans, but I think it's also not about you. It's about what you represent. And, and, and we need this generation of leaders like you now more than ever, because the fight ain't over. The fight's in many ways, just getting started and the rebuilding you know, winning the fight may, may actually be easier than rebuilding after the fight. And so that right? you're 100% you're right. And listen, we win with coalitions, yep. period. We win with coalitions. We will lose with divisions. We have to be able to build a, build a strong coalition that cares deeply about protecting our future in a way that's going to protect everybody. If America's uh, a team game and you're, you know, you're a hell of a quarterback. I'll be your right, your left tackle. And I think there's a lot of people who want to be your left tackle over the next couple of years and who, who are down for whatever. Um, I promised Brian, the great Brian Jones that I'd, that I'd let you out of here in time for a hard stop. I want to present you gifts, okay? You're going to get, we're still doing peeps. So Easter's- Oh, I love it. <laughs> we have new independent Americans gear coming. It should be up on the website this week or next. You're going to get some of that. Beautiful. Um, not made by Under Armour, but made by Oscar Mike. <laughs> Under Armour, you should, you know, acquire uh, Oscar Mike for a billion dollars. Uh, and some Uncle Nearest whiskey from our friend Jeffrey Wright. And Uncle the Nearest, I love that stuff. They are great. See, they are great supporters of the show. I'm going to send you They're some. Awesome. Back. And I will ask you to end uh, the final question that continues to divide, to divide Americans. We, we unite people, we bring light, but not heat. But there's one question that has torn America apart in Westmore. This is a tough one. If you're gonna be a politician, you're gonna have to answer tough questions. You, right. you, you, can't, you can't pick a neutral ground or punt on this one. Westmore, pancakes or waffles? Ah, oh, can we pancakes? Pancakes. Why? Pancakes. And so, 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 here, so here's why. Um, I think waffles are almost too cute, right? Like waffles, they, it's perfectly symmetrical. You know, it's the little pockets for the syrup. It's, they're almost too cute. Pancakes are messy. They are, they are complex because, you know, waffles are very much like this is the size of your waffle. Pancakes, if I have three waffles, I will have three completely different size pancakes. They will be all over the place. And I love that. I love it because we're messy. We are messy as a people and that's okay because we're freaking delicious. So pancakes all day long. Best answer ever. I hope if you're governor, you have maybe have pancake Sunday with Wes. That would be a great family day. We could make a syrup out of uncle nearest. We could all hang out and, uh, and watch uh, the expanse. Pancakes. Interesting. What's that? Oh, I like that. I said uncle nearest pancakes. I like that idea. Yeah, they should give us a cut of that. Um, but, but 
uh, I am infinitely grateful for your leadership, for your friendship, for your support, for Righteous Media, for me, my family, just for all that you do. I love you. Um, I'm grateful that our country has a, a leader like you. Baltimore is lucky to have you. Um, you know, if it was a draft, I wish New York could draft you and get you to run for governor of, 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 of New York, but Maryland's going to be lucky to have you. America's lucky to have you. Uh, your family is a great inspiration as well. Um, and next time we can go deeper on parenting and all the lessons you show me there, but you are, you're what this country is all about, my friend. And I'm grateful for your leadership. I'm excited for what's next. I promised people we bring hope. So the hope is also a to be continued. Wes Moore will be back. Follow him. He is inspiring. He's incredible. Uh, and he is definitely staying vigilant. Thank you, my friend, for all that you do and for joining us. You're the best brother. Bless you, man. Thank you. You got it. Pancakes for everybody. <laughs>